A woman leaves the hospital with her baby two days after giving birth. No one will know she was pregnant and no one will see the baby she carried out ever again. The question that we need answered is where is baby Tegan? This is the story of Kelly Lane. Are you ready to feel the rage? Are you ready to feel the rage? We woke up and we chose rage today. We chose rage. <laughs> if you didn't choose rage today, this story will be too much for you. Okay? This story will be too much for you in any way, shape, or form. Even if you haven't chosen rage today. Whatever your pronouns are, this story will piss you off. Let me just tell you straight up how it is. I don't lie to the people that watch my videos. And I know the ins and outs of this case. I have researched it before for my podcast and I'm redoing it now for this channel. Why, Maya? Why do you suffer? Why do you put yourself through suffering? Because we have a mission to figure out where the hell is baby Tegan. And when I covered it on the podcast, I still did a decent job. It was like the longest podcast episode ever. I said that Kelly Lane was one of a kind. That is because there has never been a true crime story like Kelly Lane's. And come closer. No, come closer to me. There never will be, okay? This is not a precedent. This is not me setting an example of how you should be living your life. This story will make you sick. So just bear that in mind as you're watching it. Another thing that I have promised you two weeks ago when I gave you the agenda telling you that I'm gonna go on holiday. So as you're listening to this, I'm hopefully back home if my COVID test is negative. What I promised you is that this story will change how you perceive true crime. What I didn't promise you is that it might also put you through like depression. I still cannot detach myself from this story. Now it's me researching it for the second time. And still, as I was researching it this week, I would be lying in bed before sleep thinking all over the world, in freaking Australia, it's different time of day, doesn't matter, set it up, set up the time zones, equalize the time zones. Another woman is in jail, is trying to fall asleep. What? the hell is going through her head. Now that I confused all of you, let me give you a disclaimer and then let us dive in because now you're confused and I love you confused so that I can untangle the story. Can you tell that I drank Red Bull? Yes. I think collectively they can all agree you are caffeinated and ready. Why is the name? Gone Bad is the game. Gone Bad is the series that I do on this very channel, you're in the right place, where I talk about a person that has lived a normal life. They have lived kind of like a boring life, like you and me, and then one day they flip a switch. They decided to switch to crime. And we talk about what got them there, how did they get there, and why. And when it comes to the disclaimer, this story contains the themes of alleged child murder, multiple abortions, and just in general, adult teens. Your discretion is very much so advised because we are about to get incensed. Let's go. Where I will be starting our story today is in the town of Manly, north of Sydney, in New South Wales, Australia. And we are starting it off within the walls of the Auburn Hospital. The date is 12th of September 1996. And Kelly Lane is in this hospital in order to give birth to her second child. Two days later, on the 14th of September, a doctor will come by to examine baby Tegan just before lunchtime. He determined that there were no abnormalities and, finding none, he declared both baby and the mom fit for discharge. Next, a nurse would walk into the ward where Kelly was staying and realizing that Kelly and the baby have left, she also finds that all of the paperwork that Kelly was supposed to complete is gone with her. She notices that nobody came to the hospital to visit them within the past few days, and that she also didn't ask anybody to call somebody to pick her up. 
In fact, no nurses or doctors have actually seen Kelly Lane leave carrying a baby. The nurse would note down that that morning baby Tegan was due to have a blood sample taken that's also known as a Guthrie test. As this nurse is running through the file, she realizes that a doctor has signed off on her being discharged, and she spots the name in the file of Kelly's midwife, this woman named Julie Melville. And this midwife was supposed to organize the Guthrie test. Having this in mind, the nurse picks up the phone and rings the hospital close to Kelly's home address, getting them to arrange the follow-up home visit by a hospital midwife in the next couple of days, to make sure that the Guthrie test and all of the other checks on baby Tegan are carried out. She finishes making the notes on Kelly Lane and baby Tegan in this small file, closes it and continues her busy shift. What this nurse couldn't have known continuing her shift during that day was that Kelly Lane was already attending a wedding. Baby Tegan was not present at this wedding. Kelly would not mention her. In fact, no one knew that Kelly was pregnant three times before this child, nor that she had just given birth two days ago. They wouldn't know that this was Kelly's second birth and that within past four hours, baby Tegan disappeared and her mother Kelly was the last person to see her alive. Now that I set the stage, let us go into Kelly's background. Let's start from day zero. She is truly the patient zero in this freaking situation. <laughs> if I were to set a scene of Kelly Lane's life and what was to come, it would sound something like this. In a town named Manly lived a teenager called Kelly Lane. Without anybody noticing, between her age of 17 and 21, she'd get pregnant five times while living with her parents and having a budding social life. Three of these children will be born, two pregnancies will be terminated, and at the point of being caught, she would be pregnant with her sixth child. Before the timeline of the pregnancies, Kelly Lane had to be born, and so she was. On the 21st of March, 1975, Kelly was born to Sandra Lane and Robert Lane. Sandra worked at the hospital before, and she was now teaching water polo, while Robert Lane was a retired police officer who played both surfing and rugby professionally when he was younger, and right now he would be teaching a rugby team. Manly in itself as a place gives me one of those like really prominent, affluent, small-time vibes where everybody's clicky, that's what everybody says in this story, and where Lane's held some form of power. That is going to become a prevalent theme of this video because nobody would really go back to Lane's about anything that Kelly would do in the future. And this would also be the main part once we get to talk about the investigation because nobody really wanted to speak to journalists, to the police, because of the fear that it will go back to the Lane's. Because they sort of had a status and by one person working for the hospitals, working for the healthcare system, and the other one being a retired police officer, plus with the status that they have held now, being these important figures within sports, well, you can sort of understand why. And in this way, you can kind of form a picture of what Kelly's childhood will be like. She would have pretty strict parents with high expectations, so she had to do well in school, and she also had to do well within different hobbies, different areas of interest. So she started playing different sports and then found that her strong suit is water polo. When we meet Kelly in 1992, she will be attending McKellar Girls High School in Manly, and she will be on a water polo team, playing that on the side, and dating one of her first boyfriends, this guy called Aaron Tayak. With Aaron, she will get pregnant for the first time, and here is probably the only pregnancy that she actually shared with somebody. She shared it with Aaron, that she accidentally got pregnant, but she will terminate it, she will abort it, she caught it in time. 
So she took this ferry to Sydney, which was apparently only like 15-20 minutes, and went to a clinic by herself, telling no friends, no family. At this point, she was still living with her parents, and she terminated her pregnancy. Something that will become prevalent and that you really need to get stuck into your heads in this story is the fact that Kelly, throughout all of these years, would be taking contraception. She would be taking contraceptive pill. And she would just tell people that she was doing it the wrong way. Like, listen, I've listened to so many things on this case. I have read a book, The Nice Girl, listened to the Problem Child podcast, which is a really great source for this case, listened to the Red Handed podcast, cover it here in the UK, read a bunch of other sources when I researched it back then. I still cannot figure out what that means. You just swallow the damn thing. And that comes from somebody who actually has a really psychological thing when it comes to medication, where I need to chew on them. I don't know. I just can't swallow it because psychologically something is blocking it. And still, I chew my contraceptive pill. It's one thing if she just came out and said, I missed out on the days and then it kept repeating itself and I realized that there was a problem. But it's a completely different thing to come and say, I was doing it wrong. How? Plus, there will be multiple opportunities during the story where she will be going to abortion clinics, to hospitals, where people both gave her further contraception and probably also explained to her how often she needs to take it and in what way. The only other reason that the problem child offered for the contraception pill possibly not working in her case without her knowing, would be because Kelly on the side was going hard at drinking. She would be going out after every single water polo match, like multiple times a week, and would be quite known within her friendship group for just always drinking heavily. So the idea here is that she would be drinking so heavily to the point of throwing up couple of nights a week, and then the pill wouldn't be absorbed in the system, and as such, she would get pregnant each and every time. And then again, of course, if she was to come to the abortion clinic or to a hospital, well, they wouldn't know of her lifestyle. They might not have known of that. She was still a teenager, so they couldn't really explain to her that she shouldn't really be drinking when taking the pill or make sure that there is enough time for it to absorb. That's like the only logical explanation in this story because truly there's no other. You literally take a pill, you swallow it. That's about it. That's as hard as it gets. Another thing that I wanted to quickly mention is Kelly 17 at this point, so she's still a teenager. I think if this case was to have happened in the US, the outcome would have been completely different to begin with. But also, I think the whole focus of the story would have become completely different just because of a concept of a teenage pregnancy. I just wanted to put that out there because even after researching this story twice, really the mental health issues are never fully addressed during, like, interrogations, investigation, for the trial... It's just never, like, the focal point in this story. Whereas I think if this case was to have happened in the US, that would be what would be driving this narrative. Completely different angle, completely different narrative. We would know of all of these multiple diagnoses. And here, you kind of had to look on the side. I had to dig when it comes to motivations, when it comes to concealed pregnancies. I literally had to dig and research on that, rather than that being what drives the story and how it's explained to the jury. Due to this abortion, there is kind of a drift between Aaron and Kelly, and eventually they would separate. They wouldn't be official anymore, but they would kind of still be sleeping together now and then. And at this time, Kelly is also dating a guy who was married and older than her, and his name will be protected by the court records. So we are in 1993, she's still sleeping with Aaron, and she's also sleeping with this older married guy when she gets pregnant for the second time. Yet again, without anybody knowing, she takes the ferry to Sydney, now goes to a different clinic, 
she isn't going to clinics around her home because, as I mentioned, her mom worked for the hospitals at some point in her life, so she thought people might find a link, they might find a connection. So that's why she goes to Sydney, and in order to not get suspected again, she chooses a different hospital. I don't know what the situation is now in Australia, because obviously healthcare is different throughout the world, but at the time Kelly was doing this, as long as she would be doing this in a different clinic, the medical records wouldn't be shared between the hospitals and the clinics. And also it is suspected that a lot of these clinics were private, that not everything was going through Medicare, which I think is the equivalent of the NHS here which brings so many questions about maybe the costs here. Was all of this actually covered? Did she actually have to pay for any of these abortions, any of these procedures? And if so, how did her parents not know? But here she finds a different clinic, she goes there and she is 20 weeks pregnant at a time. And at this clinic, they tell her our cutoff point is 18 weeks, we really can't risk it, we can't do this abortion for you. With this information in mind, she will go to the third clinic in Sydney now, and here she will give them some lies. I'm not really sure what information she told them, probably that she is pregnant for lesser amount of time. And what you need to know about Kelly is that she is great at manipulating. Once the timing is tight, she will say whatever she needs in order to get this done, in order to jump a hurdle, in order to pass an obstacle in her life. So here she manages to convince this hospital staff, this clinic staff, to go through with an abortion. Briefly, what we should touch upon, because you're probably screaming at the screen by this point, is, okay, Maya, this is the second pregnancy that she's terminating now. She's a teenager that plays water polo. Like, if you play water polo professionally, I know, because for the podcast, I interviewed my brother who did it at the time, and the training is on. Every day, you go in the morning, you go in the evening, for a couple of hours, you train in the middle, you do whatever you're doing with your day, going to school, going to work, and it's harsh, it's full on. Because she would be seen every day in a bathing suit by her friends, by her water polo teammates, by her coaches, the grown-ups at this pool, and nobody noticed, nobody mentioned anything to her parents. Later in this story, her friends would be giving different reasons. Reason number one, well, her mom wouldn't let her play water polo. She's a woman, like, she actually lives with her. She would have clearly noticed if her own daughter was pregnant. She wouldn't have let her play this strenuous sport if she was actually pregnant all of this time. Second reason, Kelly was concealing her belly a lot of times. She would be concealing it with a towel in the changing room and all the way to the pool, and then, as she would be by the pool, she'd just, like, take it off and sort of, like, dunk in. But people would later testify that they have seen the bump under the water, that they have seen when she would take the towel and dive in. And the coaches from different teams, when she would be playing at matches, would say later that they knew this girl was pregnant. They just never understood why anybody let her play. And third reason, her friends. Her friends would later say that, well, she was wearing loose clothing. She was still going out drinking and partying. Why would somebody pregnant be doing that? Emphasis on friends. If I asked you right now, how many friends do you have? And you told me, oh my, I have 20 friends, and out of them, 10 are my best friends. No, you have zero friends, and you have minus negative 10 best friends. You have no friends. Kelly in this story had no real friends. She had nobody in this corner. You can fight me in the comments on this one. I don't care. She had no real friends in this story. What pisses me off, though, because this is quite like a cliquey group environment, so unfortunately I understand the concept of having no real friends in that environment, because that's not who I fit in, so I kind of see it from a distance, I'm like, I want nothing to do with this. 
What pisses me off is the grown-ups in this whole story. All of the coaches that just like turn the blind eye, like, ooh, peekaboo, it looks like it's a bit of a baby bump, let's not mention it ever. And then what, she drops like 10 kg the next day and you're like, you see, I knew it. She's gonna be a problem solver. Again, I knew it. She'll bounce back. She'll bounce right back and nobody just mentions that. Her parents, her mother that was pregnant with her before. No, the grown-ups just are like playing a game of pick up like, ooh, now there's a bump. Now there isn't. Like there's not a child growing inside of a bump. I got carried away. I didn't finish my point on her friends and their reasoning. So some of her friends would later say that even when they would approach her, any time any negative comment would come about Kelly, she would get really snappy. She was really abrasive as a person. And that is why they never actually approached her to ask her, well, are you pregnant? And if so, why are you still playing water polo? After her second termination, Kelly just goes back to her life as if nothing had happened. After all of these terminations and pregnancies, Kelly would never give herself like a day break, a week of a break, because then that would be seen suspicious by her parents, by her teammates, and they would maybe be able to like do the math in their head and figure out that, God forbid, maybe she was actually pregnant. She wasn't just wearing all of these loose clothing for nothing. And never, ever, just saying if you were expecting it to come, will Kelly have a reflection moment? She will never reflect upon her actions, be like, okay, this is what I did wrong, this is how I felt, this is what I was put through, I felt shame, I don't want it to repeat itself, and this is what I'm going to do in order to make that not happen again. That doesn't happen. She goes back to her life, and now we are in 1994. She starts dating this guy, Paul, who is kind of like at her level, but in a different sport. He was playing rugby. As her and Paul would be going out with her friends, with his teammates, all of them mingling around, Kelly would meet one of Paul's teammates, this guy named Duncan Gillis. And there are not many names that you should be remembering in this story. Duncan Gillis is one name that should be remembered because between the period of 1994 and 1998, Kelly would officially be seeing Duncan Gillis and unofficially would still be sleeping with Paul. There were benefits to this from both sides. Kelly definitely had a type. Like, among most of her boyfriends, all of them will be in professional sports. She did love her guys fit. Can't blame her for that. But also there was a benefit to somebody who is a rugby player dating a daughter of another famous rugby player that is also training rugby teams. You see how this might have benefited Duncan as well. From the book, The Nice Girl, I am led to believe that her parents knew and fully supported her relationships. So this story isn't about her hiding her relationships from her parents. Even with Aaron, from what the book states, Kelly would still be bringing him home. He would sometimes be sleeping over when her father would be coaching elsewhere. Her mother would allow him to apparently sleep over in Kelly's room when she was 17. Listen, this is what the book says. I'm just a messenger. But with Duncan, it definitely happened. He would be coming home to visit Kelly, to stay for dinner, sometimes to sleep over, and Kelly would be sleeping over at his. So their families also knew one another, meaning that they also knew that they were doing it. I am saying this as dramatically because of what I'm going to say next. In the early 1995, Kelly realized she was pregnant yet again, for the third time. And she also realized she might be a bit further along than she wanted to be. At this point, Kelly was six months pregnant. On the 18th of March, 1995, just a few days before her 20th birthday and a few days before her due date, Kelly would be playing a water polo match. After this match, the team would go to celebrate with a couple of drinks. Kelly joins them. But at this bar, people would notice that Kelly 
kind of just disappeared. And that is because at this bar, when she went to the toilet, she realized that her water broke. So now she had to find a hospital where she can give birth. There will be speculations here as to why she didn't try to abort like she did the past two pregnancies. And from everything I've read, either she realized herself there were only three clinics in the area, two where she did abort, and then the third one that told her that it's too late, that there was a cutoff point. So she was out of clinics and didn't want to go to the one for the second time because then it would flag up on their system or they would have to like ring up other clinics in order to exchange these records. But also I read in one of the sources that she did go to one of the clinics when she was at the six month mark and that they told her that it's too late. So she just said, you know what, I mean, what can I do at this point? I need to continue term and then just continue her life as normal, without telling anybody. So her water broke and she leaves this party and she will go by herself to the King George V hospital and camp her down. Here a pattern will begin where Kelly would start lying about every single thing. She would tell them that she is from birth, that she is here just for a couple of days and, I don't know, forgot that it was her due date, so she just needs to give birth. She tells them that she needs to give this child up for an adoption because she isn't on such great terms with the child's father. She gives them Duncan's name but a fake address and she gives them a fake address in Perth. We gotta talk about this because people don't spot this thing necessarily. This is 1995. This isn't the smartphone era. This isn't the Google era where you could just Google things from anywhere and everywhere. It was said that she played in Perth, like played water polo match before in Perth, so maybe she just remembered a random address and that's the address that she gave them. Or maybe this is just a bit more calculated than we'd like to think. The hospital staff at this King George hospital was a bit weirded out by Kelly because here is this woman that apparently traveled from Perth on her own neglecting the fact that her due date is coming up, she didn't bring anybody along, and she's here by herself. She doesn't have any visitors, anybody coming to, like, collect her and the baby from the hospital, and she is urging the staff that the baby needs to be adopted in the next couple of days. Because of all of these factors, the hospital staff sends a social worker her way. They send this social worker to speak to her, to see, like, you know, what seems to be the issue. And here she just says nothing is wrong, she just, you know, the father doesn't want the baby, she accidentally got pregnant and then it was too late to abort. So she just wants to make sure that the adoption is done promptly. And also, if she could only have a day pass out. Like, the very next day after giving birth, like, if she could just go out and then she will return. She just needs a day pass. I don't know what excuse she gave them, but the hospital staff gives it to her. This baby stays inside of the hospital. And the reason why Kelly needed a day pass is because it was her 20th birthday. And she had to keep appearances and show up for her own birthday party. In the upcoming weeks and months, she would lie multiple times. She now knew that she probably made a mistake by mentioning Duncan Gillis, but luckily she gave a fake address, so they couldn't really reach him. So at first she says that the father was aware of the child, and then later she would change the sworn statement by saying that the father doesn't want anything to do with the family and with the child in order for the adoption to be sped up. But she really underestimated how long this would take. And this is the part where logistically I can't picture it because this baby was never seen by her friends and family. So she was just going between hospital and her daily life for 14 months before this baby would get adopted. These social workers really did try to reach out to Duncan at the time, by any means that were disposable to them at the time. They would post letters asking him to be involved, but they had the wrong address. So they would call the number, and then the man that responded to the number said that no Duncan lives at this address. 
But because of Kelly's lies, because of her insisting that she is actually training to become an Olympian and that this is why she needs this adoption to go through faster, that the father now suddenly doesn't want to do anything with a child, so yet again she can't have this child impede her career and now she doesn't want anything to do with it. At the time that the baby TR would get adopted, that's what she's known under these initials in all of the court records, Kelly would be pregnant yet again. At this point, because she has already had two terminations and one pregnancy carried to term, and she has had no reflections, let us reflect for a brief moment. Here we have one of the two things. There's either a concealment of pregnancy or a denial of it. So what's the difference? A concealed pregnancy is the one where a woman knows that she is pregnant, like intellectually she is aware of the pregnancy, but doesn't tell anybody. Or those who are told conceal the facts from the health professionals. A denial of pregnancy is when the woman is unaware of or is unable to accept that she is pregnant. This denied pregnancy kind of has like a separate point to it, like a 1B, which is affective denial. And that is when the woman is intellectually aware they're pregnant, but making little emotional or physical preparation for this birth. And persistent denial occurs when a woman discovers their pregnancy in the third trimester, but still fails to seek antenatal care. Usually the reasons for both denied and concealed pregnancies is the age of the woman. Usually they happen to women who are under the age of 18. They can happen for a variety of reasons, like meeting disapproval, getting pregnant due to an affair, due to sexual abuse, shame because the pregnancy was conceived before marriage, for example. And due to the studies done, interestingly, we actually know that 79% of women who conceal a pregnancy, who conceal a pregnancy, do it fearing a parental reaction. Do it because they fear the shame that they will bring upon their family. Now, stats to the side, where we left this story off was with baby TR being put up for adoption. And between 9 and 14 months after her birth, Kelly would conceive yet another child. She would be pregnant for the fourth time now. And here she really wasn't so sure as to who the father would be, because she was still officially dating Duncan, but she would be having these different partners on the side, sometimes even further along with her pregnancy, like during the second and third trimester. The question that probably popped into your head a couple of times here is that this is now the second pregnancy within her time with Duncan. How is he not noticing. He would later testify in court, and this was so cringe to read, that even when they would be having sex, that she would kind of, in a non-intentional way, in the way that he was unsuspecting, always get them to do it from the back, and he kind of described it from like, not even doggy style, but just like within bed, where he would be like hitting it from the back, so there was not too much involvement, like it wasn't a missionary, he wasn't as aware of a baby bump. She would be wearing loose clothes. <laughs> I can't do really this story no more. He was happy in this relationship, like he isn't going to call his new girlfriend Porky and tell her, oh, I think you've gained a bit of weight. So he was unsuspecting as well. At this point, it was also said that Duncan kind of started seeing other women on the side as well, because he was aware that, yes, Kelly was officially with him, but unofficially with quite a few people on the side. In terms of her education, she would enroll into an arts degree at the University of Newcastle, but then she dropped out and went to study at the Australian College of Physical Education. And while she was studying there, she was also working part-time at Ravenswood School for Girls as a water polo coach. Here at Ravenswood, multiple sources stated that in order to get that job position, she lied on multiple points on her CV. 
she said she was qualified with honors when she was only studying it at the time and she also gave like a lot of fake credentials and references that again will be brought up later to sort of fully describe her character. What did we learn during this video? Number one, don't have fake friends. You don't have 10 best friends. Number two, always cut it, cut it, stop it. Emoji with a girl with the crossed hands when it comes to people who tell these little white lies when there is no need. When there is no need to lie because she could have gotten that job position because of her parents regardless. So there's no need to lie. If they lie about small things, they will lie about bigger things and it will become a bigger problem in the end. Seek therapy. <laughs> Seek therapy on behalf of your friends in those situations. But just emoji with girl the cops hands. During this time, she also has a spot at the New South Wales water polo team and they represent Australia at the World Championships in Canada where she receives a silver medal all, again, whilst she is pregnant. Because she is so busy with everything that is going on in her life, the part-time coaching job, still playing water polo for the team now, her studies, she doesn't realize that she is pregnant once again and that, yet again, it seems to be too late to terminate the pregnancy. As she comes to this realization, an invitation for a wedding comes Kelly's way. One of her friends is getting married mid-September, 14th of September, to be exact. And this is when the panic sets in. I'm not a fly in the room where Kelly Lane was in any of the rooms I would love to have been, but I don't know if this is the moment when the panic sets, or are there still plenty of weeks before that moment arrives, but at some point the panic does set in, because she realizes her due date is actually end of September. And she's like, okay, this doesn't really suit me because my priorities are to make it to the friend's wedding because if I don't, if I show up there pregnant, the jig is finally up. Finally, everything is going to be discovered and there's just going to be a chain reaction where they're going to discover all of my lies. So I must prevent that at all costs. This is where Kelly Lane, for the first time in the past five years, has some form of pre-planning for all the wrong reasons. So, in order for her to attend the wedding on the 14th, she knows she has to give herself some time, sort of like a week in order to sort out the adoption papers, still leave that baby in the hospital, and also to recover for this wedding so that she can appear, look all glowing and nobody suspects anything. In order for that to happen, now she has to go to yet another hospital where she hasn't been and convince them that she needs to be induced, that she needs to give this birth here and now. So she drives herself to Ride Hospital. And here she tells them she is in so much pain, she needs to be induced, her back is healing her. She gives them all this sob story. But they do the examinations, they realize that she's only 38 weeks pregnant. And I think the normal term is 42 weeks, so that it's too early. And they tell her, like, we can't induce her, like, you are just not ready to give birth yet. It would put you and the baby in danger. That's not good enough for Kelly, though. So three days later, she goes back to the right hospital and she begs them. She's like, I'm in so much pain. They again reject her. They give her painkillers. They tell her, we just told you a couple of days ago, we can't do it. So she figures out, okay, I need to put on the drama. I need to be even more dramatic. I need to go to a different hospital and try my luck there. This is when she will go to the Auburn Hospital, where she will end up giving birth. And here she actually probably emptied up a notch and told them that she was overdue. And here, because of her acting skills, I suppose, they didn't conduct the similar exams in order to find out that she is not overdue. And they start inducing her, and she gives birth to baby Tegan. Her giving birth here won't be the only operation, the only procedure that she would go to, because this birth resulted in some complications. It resulted in something that is called placenta accreta. 
This, according to Google, happens when the placenta detaches from the uterine wall after the childbirth, meaning that the placenta is still in you and needs to be removed after the child is out. This is really painful, it's not like a jokey procedure, and also it can result in blood loss. She actually lost a liter of her blood during this procedure, and as the ladies from the Red Handed Podcast described it, this is just as if it's a rotting flesh that's within you. You are in so much pain, like it needs to be done, it needs to be removed out of you. And that's one other thing that adds to this whole story. She's yet again alone at a hospital, giving birth to yet another child, not a single visitor in sight. She must feel some form of fear, must be in so much pain, and what she's thinking about is how she's going to make it to the wedding two days from now. Because she is on this deadline here, she knows that she doesn't have the time to complete this adoption paperwork, and she knows that she needs to leave this hospital with this child. This is where we pick up at the beginning of this story, where the doctors signed off on her release and she was free to go. But the fact that nobody saw her leave made people suspect that she probably during these two days was kind of like moving around, or maybe she was familiar with the hospital, and she must have left with baby Tegan through a fire exit, because no doctors, no nurses would have seen her leave through the front door. The next thing we know happened for sure is that after the hospital, she went to Duncan's house. He got dressed there, and then they went to hers in order for her to change clothes, to get dressed, and then both of them went to this wedding. So between 12 and 4 p.m., we lose track of baby Tegan. And here the timeline is really murky. There are a couple of gaps, so let me just point them out. Something that is never completely clarified is how she left at hospital. Was it through the front door? Was it through the back door? Was it through a fire exit? How did she leave it? The next gap in this story would be the mode of transportation. There will be speculations later about whether or not a cab driver has picked her up. Somebody would come forward to claim that they have, and that they have seen a baby, and then, well, later they don't know what really happened, but nothing would really come from that. When it comes to the modes of transportation, we know that she has driven herself to the hospital in order to be induced. And later what would come up is that she would lawyer up once this investigation started, only once they wanted to search her car. Only once they wanted to probably like spray luminal and like check for physical DNA. So does that lead us to believe that she has driven herself out to this hospital later? We know she was present at that wedding without a child because there are video recordings, there are pictures of her, and there are different representations of what she was like at the wedding. There are people that said she was a bit more withdrawn. There are people that said that she was just her old self, that she was drinking, partying, just as if nothing has happened. And also, she was wearing a white jumpsuit at that wedding, which is just brave and weird and strange, and you don't wear white at a wedding, but you also don't wear white once you have had a pregnancy and a birth and another operation due to a complication. Like, what if you bleed? Such a... She's a character. I told you, she's a, she's one of a kind in all the wrong ways, but one of a kind for sure. The next thing we know for sure is that the nurse tried to reach the hospital in her area, and that Kelly called back and she said that she wants to cancel all of the hospital visits because her midwife is going to take care of everything. The midwife name that she gave was invented. But what will come out later is that this exact name is Duncan Gillis' mother's name. Julia Melville? Yeah. I don't know that she has some beef against Duncan here. Why is she giving his name for no particular reason? Why isn't she inventing names in this story? 
is just another unanswerable fact. Like, is this like some sort of fuck you moment where she might put his mom in trouble? Why I'm saying this is because Julie Melville was actually a nurse. Like, his mom was an actual nurse and later she will have to be investigated into like, does she have some fake midwife qualifications because of Kelly's lies? Because of Kelly's lies, because the hospital staff believes that everything is going to be handled by her midwife, they don't investigate, they don't push the matter further. And it won't be for other three years until somebody started looking in baby Tegan's disappearance. As far as all of the friends and family know, Kelly's ending 1996 on a high. She is still with Duncan, she is getting invited to his brother's wedding, just seems to be another sign that everything is going right and that these families might see the future together. There's also talk at this wedding at another push in order to have women's water polo team, including in the upcoming year 2000 Olympics. By the end of 1996, the future is looking promising for her. That is until the very next year. She does play with her team for Belmain in the club finals, helping the club beat Sydney University. But she gets dropped from the senior state side and she also isn't chosen for the Women's World Cup. So she finds herself at the poolside watching her teammates play the games that she is meant to play in order to achieve this game and play at the Olympics. By the end of 1997, it was actually decided that women's water polo team will make the cut and they could compete at the Olympics. So Kelly, even though she isn't on the team, she's still hopeful. She asked this college to give her a year and a half off so she can focus on making the Australian team. And as much as that's great how relentless she was, Later, it would come to life that none of her coaches ever saw her as even a potential contender. And I'm not sure if they publicly voiced this. Well, they did in a form because she didn't make the team on multiple occasions while the team was being formed. But I'm not really sure that it ever properly reached Kelly, if you know what I mean. Because at this point, she was just in constant denial. We know that she lived in denial for most of her four pregnancies by now. But we really can't neglect to mention how that seeps through other parts of her life as well. Her relationship with Duncan. She thinks it's official, it's going somewhere, while both of them are having affairs on the side. Her water polo career. She is constantly thinking that she is at the Olympian level while her coaches and everybody else doesn't. We go back to everything being an obstacle, everything being a hurdle, and Kelly being a problem solver in every situation. So in 1998, Duncan finally breaks up with her, and she starts dating this new guy called Adam. And here everybody is bracing themselves because of the line that I'm going to utter once again. By August 1998, Kelly Lane was pregnant again. Somehow, as if she has not done this four other times, it escapes her to abort in time. It escapes her to figure out how far along she is. And at the moment that she realizes and wants to do something about it, she is already 25 weeks along. She actually jumped on a flight to Brisbane here in order to go to another abortion clinic that she hasn't attended yet, but they tell her that she is 25 weeks along, that they definitely cannot perform an abortion on her this time and that nobody will, and they send her home. Now she has a choice of going back to the first clinic that performed the abortion, but she doesn't want to risk being discovered. Just like with her other two pregnancies that she carried to term, she decides to carry on being pregnant and think about it later. Why figure it out now when you can leave it for the third trimester, for when your water breaks literally on the location then and there? In mid-1999, she turns up to the hospital unannounced. But unlike with her first two births, Kelly would have been to this hospital before. This would be the right hospital where three years ago she received some treatment for pain and where they rejected inducing her. 
This means that here Kelly finally made a mistake because they kept the record of the visit where she came heavily pregnant asking to be induced, meaning that they know that that child exists. Here, when the hospital staff asks her, where is this child baby? We are referring to baby Tegan here. She says, she's at home, of course. Can we just get to the matter of the day? When they ask her why nobody's there with her, no partner, no parents, no friends, she says she is actually living in London. She's just visiting Sydney at the time. They ask her who took care of her prenatal care. She lies and tells that she has been receiving antenatal care by Royal Women's Hospital in Brisbane. This is where, yet again, she makes another mistake. By this point, the processes have kind of changed, but also she has just flipped a coin on the location and just changed that she won't use hospital staff here to contact social workers because, you know, that might bring up some risks. So she's going to ring an adoption agency herself. So she rings this adoption agency called Angley Care. And here, an adoption worker, Virginia Fung, answers Kelly's call. She tells Virginia that this is her first child and that she wants this adoption to be done as speedily as possible. And, of course, the child is not aware of this, like, they shouldn't really contact him, he doesn't want anything to do with this kid. And Virginia kind of tells her, well, without the father's consent, this adoption process might actually last for years. So, I do need to contact him. And it's not really clear here, but I believe it is because Virginia told her this, that Kelly actually gave Duncan's real address. I could be completely wrong. It could be that Virginia was actually smarter than plenty of people in this case, and that she figured out, like, how she can search for this guy, and that he was kind of famous, probably, like, ending up in newspapers, the news, you know. So, she figured out how to contact Duncan. And Duncan actually received a letter about this child, about the matter of Kelly Lane, and how he needs to sign off on adoption papers. And at this point, Duncan is dating a different girlfriend. He's dating this woman named Karen. And he receives this letter and he's like, this doesn't make sense. Like, let me go discuss it with Karen. Like, I just don't understand what is going on. Can she maybe clarify, like... I am definitely not the father of this child because we have broken up about two years ago. And this, ladies and gents, is when things get hectic because the goose chase of Kelly Lane begins. Virginia here is really great at her job. Like, she is the real MVP of this freaking story because she does not take her bullshit. Kelly, again, tries selling a sob story, different lies, spinning different lies every time she would meet Virginia. So, Virginia meets up with her and she's like, um, I tried you on your fake phone. I arranged to meet up with you a couple of times. You don't show up, Kelly. There's a child that needs adopting, right? Like, also, I don't know where these kids are at this point. Like, can they even stay at the hospital or are they in foster care just waiting to be adopted and she just does not give no shits? which also wouldn't freaking surprise me. Then she tells her she contacted Duncan and Kelly is fuming. She says, you can't be doing these things without my consent. She gets really pissed off. But Virginia is already honing in on, like, who Kelly Lane is and tries to get numbers of different places where she worked, of that school, where she's teaching part-time of her own parents. During this meeting, Kelly, of course, tries to really fake empathize. She just isn't really great at it, and Virginia sees right through it. So, she tells her that her friends, oh, such friends, they actually disowned me. Yeah, they don't want anything to do with me because I was pregnant and now I have a child that they don't know about. They don't want anything to do with me. And the father of the child, again, you see, you contacted him. Did he contact you back? He doesn't want anything to do with me either. I am abandoned. This child needs to be adopted as soon as possible. Do you not see the situation that I'm in? But right after that meeting, Duncan gives Virginia a call 
And he tells her that uh, no, this child is not his because that's kind of impossible because he has been living with his girlfriend for about a year and a half and has been broken up with Kelly for longer than that. Uh, no, Kelly didn't live in London with him, which is just another lie that she told Virginia. Uh, also, I don't think she lived in London at all to begin with. I think she was staying in Manly all of this time. So, yeah, definitely thumbs up. Go ahead towards just ruining her life, please, because I don't want to be involved. Like, this child is not mine, hence why I shouldn't be signing the adoption papers. And here, because of the sudden amount of mistakes, I kind of got to stop and think, is this, like, with murder cases, with different true crime cases, that moment when a person is finally done, they're done with lying, they're done with bullshitting, and they maybe, just maybe, want to finally be discovered, for this to be over with. Or whether she was just cocky, and she thought she will yet again get away with it. And she just didn't care. She followed the same old procedure and just moved on, thinking her life will be able to continue, as it always did, because she had nothing to prove her wrong, nothing to say that this wasn't going to be just like one of her past pregnancies. After this chat with Virginia, though, Duncan says, I still want to talk to Kelly. I just want to understand, because this isn't the Kelly that I knew. This makes no sense. So Karen is kind of, like, skeptical about this, so she says, I'm gonna go with you. I don't know what her intentions are. I don't know why she even agreed to meet up. Once Kelly meets up with Duncan and Karen, she tells them there was never a baby. She aborted this baby a year and a half ago, and Virginia is only her counselor. And Duncan is like, Virginia showed me the pictures of the child. There is a baby, Kelly. There is a baby under your name. Like, are we okay? To which she replies, which freaks both him and Karen out, she says, you were never supposed to know about the baby, which is one of the eeriest things I have heard probably ever. Definitely in this story. What do you mean? With this information, Duncan rings Virginia up and he tells her, listen, I tried to get something out of her. She denied baby at first. Then she said the baby sort of exists, but you can't be the father. So she just confirmed to me that I'm not a father. Virginia meets up with Kelly again and she's just like, okay, Kelly, fresh start. New story. Can it be the truth? Of course not. Here, Virginia asks the question again. Who is the father, Kelly? We need to speed this adoption process up, right? So, here she says the father is the guy who dumped her, and his name is Aaron Williams. He dumped her when he found out she was five months pregnant. And he is a successful banker, lives in London, and works for Barclays. She proceeds to tell a sob story, how her parents lived in London, how everybody denounced her and how she's here, and her visa is about to expire and she needs to return to London. During the next month now that Virginia discarded that there is no option of a father signing off on papers, Kelly would also be deemed fit to give her consent towards this adoption. At this point, Virginia knows that all of the stories about the UK and the visa are complete bullshit because it's been months and she hasn't been deported or anything like that. So she knows that that is bullshit, that this woman is actually Australian. But she kind of sets it aside in order to keep this child as a priority, which is something that everybody in this story should have been doing. So Kelly meets her baby boy, who at this point was staying with the foster parents. She buys him lots of toys, she cuddles him, meets him for the first and the last time. After she meets with the foster parents and with her child, they go to the adoption agency. And here, Virginia shows her this catalog of the profiles of the adoptive parents, prospective adoptive parents. And Kelly just looks at these different profiles. And there was this one where a man said that he doesn't like to keep secrets. And she points to that couple and she says, those are the ones. But that same day, just as Kelly has chosen new adoptive parents, Department of Community Services, better known as DOCS, 
had a child protection worker, unbeknownst to Kelly, on the case. This guy's name is John Borovnik, and he was this community services worker who took Kelly's case to investigate some of her previous pregnancies. And on that day, he received a health department record of Kelly giving birth to a girl three years before, in 1996, that would be baby Tegan. So, he leaves Virginia a message with this news. A couple of days later, Virginia gets a call from a different docs worker who tells her he has a file about the adoption of a child that Kelly put up for adoption after giving birth to her in 1995. So, Virginia and John get on a call and they both think this must be the same baby. But John decides to ring the hospital where Kelly supposedly gave birth in 1995 to check on that adoption. And he asks the hospital staff there, what about the baby in 1996? And they say, what baby in 1996? She only gave birth to a baby here in 1995, and that baby has been put up for an adoption. So, John needs to prove that the baby in 1996 actually existed. Now that he has this record in front of him, he first, well, probably is pissed off as we would be with how easily they just let it off by not confirming this midwife, because as soon as he tries to get hold of this Julie Millville, he can't locate her. This woman isn't registered as a midwife anywhere. Then he looks at the other factual things on this document that he could possibly confirm, and he rings the British authorities and says, hey, there was a Kelly Lane living in London, supposedly, during this period, under visitor's visa, whatever, her parents are these names, and they're like, we don't have a record of that. There was never Kelly Lane living here in the UK, in London. Because John is assigned to locate this child now, and nothing is giving him indications that this child is alive, or that anybody knows the location, that anybody knows its whereabouts, he looks Virginia into his plan in order to catch Kelly in a lie. So, Virginia meets up with her, and she says she has received the hospital record about 1995, the adoption, and asks her, why didn't you tell me about it? And she says, you know, her parents have disowned her. They actually knew about her first pregnancy, which would be another lie, and they were so disappointed in her. And she actually tells Virginia that her father was a police officer, so he's terribly disappointed in her, and she just didn't know what to do. Now, Virginia, armed with that information, goes to John, and she's like, okay, I think it's time you ring her, and you ask her about 1995, she will probably say yes, because she just told me that, and then you jump her and mention 1996 pregnancy and see what she says. John does exactly that, and Kelly says, no, she was never pregnant in 1996. Well, what are you on about? Like, So, John says to her, I have your file in front of me. I have your hospital records, Kelly. Lying about concealment of a child is not a joke. You should know, as somebody whose father was a police officer, and I will have to get police involved. So, Kelly begs him not to. And then she goes back to Virginia, writing her a page and a half long letter, thinking that empathy would work here. I don't know. She thought she can still lie her way out of this situation. Here, John decides he has finally had enough of her shit, and that there is also grounds for police investigation. So, he passes the matter on to the police. And in 1999, Detective Keho gets hold of the case, gets hold of the files. And this is where, what I mentioned at the beginning of the story, Rob Lane's, Kelly's father's influence really comes into play, and is what postpones this investigation for so long. Because when Keho got these records, these files, in 99, he thought, 
I mean, there doesn't seem to be even grounds for investigation. This seems to be someone's private matter. I don't want to embarrass this retired police officer. So within that year and next year, he only looked into three different things. One was he confirmed Kelly's registration at her college. For what reason? Fuck me if I know. Second is he tried to chase Medicare for any information on a girl called Tegan Lane. And Medicare kind of told him to F off because of the privacy grounds. And third is that Julie Melville did sound like a familiar name to the detective here because that was Duncan's mother's name. So he investigated thoroughly this woman who was completely innocent in this freaking story purely because Kelly and Duncan have dated. So he investigated her history to make sure that she isn't falsely identifying as a midwife. Priorities, sir. Have your priorities straight. In the meantime, we are all bracing ourselves for what I'm about to say next, so let me postpone it as much as possible. She's on the sidelines watching her friends play water polo. She... it must hit her at some point. The delusions of her making the team to play at the Olympics, because by this point it's year 2000. The Olympics are happening and you are not on the team. And this is where she meets this guy called Peter. Peter's parents knew Kelly's parents. Actually, Robert dated Peter's mother at some point when they were really young. And Peter's parents moved to Suffolk here in the UK, and Peter came to visit. So, Lanes obviously offered him to stay around, and as they stayed at uh, the Lane's house, they decide to find their own flat to move out of the Lane's property. And they just, at this point, are roommates. But as soon as they move together, one thing leads to the other, and they start dating. And by dating, I mean they start doing it. And she is apparently using a pill again. But it doesn't work. And she is pregnant. She's pregnant for the sixth time. For the love of God, she's pregnant again. Here, funny funny how things happen. But, but here, because the parents know the parents, and this is a suitable relationship, and she is old enough, and everything seems to be working out fine, and she doesn't have to hide things, she actually tells Peter that she's pregnant when she was four months pregnant, and she decides not to abort, because this is the relationship that she can bring home. This is the relationship that she doesn't necessarily have to hide from her parents. Funny how things happen that way. When she doesn't have to hide it, she doesn't also have to, like, murder children. Yeah. So we are now back in 2001, well, forward in 2001, when the police officers finally decide, I mean, we kind of still have this cold file case here, we need to bring her in for an investigation. And they do. And this is what she tells them. <laughs> You know ready. You think you're ready? You know ready. First things first, she sits down to be interrogated. The police officers don't notice that she is seven months pregnant at this point. Please tell me how do you cover up pregnancies like they don't notice? Cool. So they're like, hey Kelly, um Tegan Lane that day walked us through. Where is the child? She's like, funny that you asked. I have been planning to tell this story forever. So, the child is, the situation is, the child is with a man called Andrew Norris. Now that I think about it again, it might be Morris. It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, detective. Andrew, Morris, Norris, doesn't matter. This is how we met. We used to go as a water polo team out for drinks on a Friday night after the match. And this guy, Andrew showed up at this bar and we started up this fling. But then he told me he's actually in a long-term relationship. Can you believe it? With this woman called Melanie. He calls her Mel, though, and she works in retail. That's why she can't make it to Friday nights. A bit too many details? No. Yes. Let me continue. Andrew Norris then and me have a fling. Morris Norris. We have a fling. This fling results in a baby. Unlike with all of my other pregnancies and Duncan Gillis, who I dated for four years, everything else, 
I tell this man about this pregnancy. I tell my friend about it because I have a wedding to attend to. So on this day, 14th of September, Andrew Norris appears at the hospital. He's here with Mel, Melanie, and his own mother. And he tells me he's gonna take care of my baby. So I just hand over Tegan to him. He doesn't give me the address. I don't know where he left. I don't know where he lives. I just had a fling with him. I have no idea. So he left with Melanie and the mother and Tegan. Now, actually, that I think about it, I think he might have been there by himself. He might have been there by himself. He might have taken Tegan and he went into a cab. Actually, now that you're questioning me for the fourth time, he he might have driven himself. Yeah, and Drew Morris definitely drives. He drives a car. I don't know which car. I handed him over the child in a car park and he drove away. She has, during this interrogation, spinned eight different possible stories. Eight. Out of which I have probably just stated six because I don't really know what other possibilities came to her mind. Eight possible plot lines about the guy that does not exist. And you call me crazy about the girl in the back here. Think twice. Think your thoughts twice. And you call me crazy. <laughs> you and I are screaming here, right? Like the police is finally going to do something about this. Yeah. N no. So, although this interview didn't really seem like a plausible story to the police at the time, they had bigger fish to fry, and the fish was really their own. So before investigating Kelly, I couldn't actually even find records of this interview taking place, so they probably had it somewhere just written down, not recorded. Uh, they had to investigate their own department. They actually even named it Operation Florida. Apparently, the Manly police station at the time was this boys' club where they didn't play by the rules, to say it in the nicest possible way. There was a ton of corruption going on. They even had to shut down for a while, while they were being investigated externally. And by that point, Keho left. He was transferred to a different department. Completely new set of detectives got assigned. And... In the meantime, Kelly is just living her life, has given birth to another child, and one month after the other passes, until in 2003, another detective, Detective Gault, or Gout, I'm not sure how you pronounce this name that I'm putting on the screen, but he gets Kelly's file in his lap and finally decides to take a different approach and starts actually questioning her friends and family. Now, they completely put the alliance to Robert Lane and just the Lane family aside and actually start doing proper investigation. It's been years, guys. Good job. God would interview her and ask her the obvious question, facing her blatant lies, saying if Andrew Norris existed, why wouldn't you tell anybody? And she says, how do you tell people stuff like that? How do you tell people you're on your own and you've got no one? She kept repeating. I'm not passing the blame, but how can people see me every day and not know, not help? He was the only choice I had. Police were also secretly recording Kelly's phone calls. In one, she tells a friend she's terrified of losing her young daughter, Kelly's fourth child, who she kept. I used to worry so much about wanting to be a sports star and being, a, you know, achieving these wonderful things, but the only thing I'm really good at is being a mum. Kelly also reveals her fear that Robert and Sandra would find out about her secret pregnancies. Katie, when my parents find out, it's like, it's going to circulate. It's not going to, it's going to blow wide open. And they're going to be so embarrassed and ashamed. You know how that that's going to happen? Oh, it is, it is. When did you find out? When did Kelly tell you about Tegan? Well, she didn't tell us. The, the police told us. 
Why do you think Kelly felt she couldn't confide in you? I believe that she was um, trying to protect us, our standing in the community. She's trying to protect her standing in the community and, uh, and possibly the, the fathers. And um, for that reason alone. You know, it was something that she, and she was very young. 19, 19 to 21, this was <laughs> happening. So, uh, what goes through young girls' minds, well, I don't know. Yeah, I've made stupid choices, and I've made continually stupid choices, but I'll start, I can't, I can't tell what sort of person I was there. People didn't even know, people didn't even care enough to ask. People, I obviously couldn't trust to speak out to, and people didn't even know what was greater than my wanting to be held. From child to a man she'd only met a few times and the girlfriend he cheated on. You've got to be telling the absolute truth. I'm telling you, this is just so unlike a young bloke to want to raise a child. It just, that's the thing I just can't sort of grip. But obviously that's what you agreed, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I didn't really have too many options. Goat would also, for the first time, again focus properly on Duncan to eliminate him as a suspect, and he would even organize a cadaver dog search of his property at his old place where he lived during this period of time, and the dogs found nothing. Like, Duncan isn't involved in this story. Speaking of this cadaver dog search, yes, I understand why they would have conducted it at Duncan's place. They dated at the time, and also, if you remember, on the 14th of September, when Kelly left the hospital, she went to Duncan's first. But this is where I couldn't find any details of anything else. Like, why didn't they map up that area? All of the possible routes. Check for different bodies of water. Landfills, I know that this is grim, but check for any possible options where also they could conduct the cadaver search. It would be the most logical if somebody was to just dispose of a toddler's body on the day, because the time is limited. So, we know she went to Duncan's house. What time did that happen? How long would it have taken her? Was there any space there for somebody to get rid of a body? Because if we eliminate Duncan, then we know that nothing happened to Tegan between Duncan and her own house, which kind of gives us a limited space where baby Tegan could have been disposed in. So, are there any oil tanks? Are there any bodies of water? Is there any way where she could have disposed of this body? That's what drives me crazy in this story, and it has driven me when I researched it the first time why has nobody focused on that? Then he would meet with Kelly in an attempt to go back to where she had an affair with this Andrew Norris, again trying to locate this person. And this is, this is truly where the story goes somehow even more insane. So they drive around this neighborhood near this pub where they apparently met. Then, a few minutes into it, Kelly just invents that, oh, this building looks familiar. They walk inside. Kelly would comment how stairs look familiar. And then at the first floor at this place, she just points at the flat, and she tells Go that she had an affair in one of them, but she doesn't remember when and where. What she's doing is just prolonging this investigation because now the police officers have to go through this whole apartment building, do the door knock on every single door, ask for an Andrew Norris, if Andrew Norris ever lived there, see the layout that she has described from her memory and see if any of these flats matches that type of environment. During one of the interrogations, the officer asks for the obvious elephant in the room, for Melanie and Andrew and, well, how this whole discussion about Andrew taking in a child would come about. And Kelly would say they only had two discussions. One discussion was, I am pregnant and you are taking my child. And the second discussion is like he rang her being like, hey, Mel and me are here. We are taking your child. Four detectives asked Kelly the question, where's Tegan? In your words, can you just explain to us the circumstances of when the child was born and what happened subsequent to that? Uh, after a brief affair with uh, 
the father of the child, I gave birth, we made an arrangement that he would come and take custody of Tegan um, as I was unable to take care of her myself. Did you know the investigation was taking place? No. No, no idea. No idea. During her first interview with police, Kelly told detectives Tegan's father was Andrew Morris. The, the natural father of the child is Andrew Morris, is that correct? That's correct. But in a second interview, more than two years later, she told them it could be Andrew Norris. She wasn't sure. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm confused. I'm... Do, you, do you know the father of the child's mom? Yes, the What is it? Andrew Norris. Norris. Yes. Okay. It will become prevalent to go to during this investigation how much Kelly relied in a way that these detectives will also know of her dad and his history. And these new detectives truly didn't and didn't give a fuck. So sometimes in the interrogations she would mention, like, I mean, I was always ashamed and afraid of my dad. Like, you know my dad, you understand, trying to build rapport with them. But they just would never understand how this has worked in the past. And they also weren't buying into it. So she would try to push it and push further the agenda that she did all of this, that she would just give up her child to just anybody, to the fling that she had, because of how much shame she has felt. And when you hear some of the interviews with her parents, you kind of actually get to understand where she's coming from. There is this interview, I will try to put it in, but for copyright reasons, I'm not sure if, you know, the YouTube will let me. So during this interview, they ask her parents, like, what's the Kelly that they knew? And her dad says, Kelly was a wonderful daughter. And that, that interview could have stopped there. Her mom jumps in and says, and still is, but that's it. That's everything that I needed to hear. Because that tells you that he thought of her as a wonderful daughter, and then she did something that made him think she isn't anymore. This is the first time anyone's had a chance to hear about Kelly. She's in jail, and so today you're her voice. Tell me about the Kelly that you know. Well, Kelly was a wonderful daughter. Um, she still was, is. And still, still is a, a wonderful daughter. We love her dearly, even though we've been in a difficult position for many years. Then her mom, Sandy, owns, owns this interview with this one-liner. They ask the parents about how Kelly concealed the pregnancies and the mom starts talking about her wearing baggy clothes. And then she said, I mean, it's not like she wore a sign on her forehead telling us that she was pregnant. I mean, nobody, yeah. That can happen with people. I mean, they have cases where women get a stomach pain, they think, and they go and have a baby. So, in this instance, I guess it was three times. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can't. We can't say. I can't that. give you we any other say, answer. I can't can, all I can say is that nobody knew. Mm. I mean, you don't go around with a great big sign on your head saying, I've had a baby. Guys, yeah, honest truth? Honest truth? Am I the crazy one? Am I? Because in history of time, there has definitely not been a single method introduced to determine if somebody's pregnant. If only, if only she had it written on her forehead. <laughs> there is this interview where 60 Minutes Australia asks her parents about why do they think that she couldn't come to them? Why do they think that? And her dad says that she always wanted to protect them and she always wanted to protect her social standing. Which I'm sorry to mention, but it's not mentioned enough in this story. That kind of upbringing starts from home. That kind of thinking to protect everybody at all costs, by all means necessary, it comes from home. She didn't learn this just by witnessing it somewhere. She learned it from her own house. The police interrogation continues, and here they will do the due diligence when it comes to testing the paternity of the babies, and they will actually confirm that Duncan Gillis was not the father of any of them. 
they interviewed him and he has confirmed that he was never aware of any of the two pregnancies that she has had while with him. So they move on from that and this next part of the investigation focuses solely on tracking down Andrew Morris or Andrew Norris or tracking down somebody under a name of Tegan Lane that would fit that age because here with Tegan at least they knew the exact date of birth so they know the age by now and where she would have been placed had she been born and raised in Australia. So first they look for birth deaths. So first the officers approach birth deaths and marriages registry looking for Andrew Norris, looking for any female born that has a father named Andrew Norris or Morris, searching for social security payments made in relation to a female born under a father named Andrew Norris or Morris. Then they expand the search nationwide, searching for any men under that name, extending the age range to men born between 1960 and 76, because Kelly, of course, gave them some bogus birth date, because apparently she knew the birth date of her fling, but didn't know his address or any further details. They checked for, they checked with Department of Immigration to see if any men under that name have moved out of Australia between 95 and 97, then they expand that search, still find zilch. The police then searched for school records for every female named Tegan Lane that would be enrolled in school in the past couple of years. They searched through over 9,000 primary schools in Australia and got only two hits, one in Queensland and one in the Torres Strait Island, and both of them were eliminated as just false hits with, like, families of their own. When searching through these records, they were also looking for Melanie or Mel Norris and Nolene Nana Norris, because Kelly didn't only invent one name, she had to invent the Andrew Norris's mom's name as well. They find nothing. And this is where the frustration really builds up, because by this point, they never enrolled the media. This was all on the hush-hush because of the respect for the lanes or whatnot. But now, the detectives decide to change the game, because they are getting nothing from this investigation. So they organize a press conference and release as much of this story as possible to the media. They try to simplify it, so what the reporters will hear is that Kelly gave birth to four children, one who lives with her now, and three others who were kept in secret from her friends and family. One of those babies, named Tegan, was disappeared, and they fear that the baby is dead. With the journalists and the media now taking the wheel on this story, the courts get interested and actually assess the seriousness of it, and finally, in 2005, a coronial inquest is held. This is to determine whether there is enough basis to say that Tegan Lane is dead. From what I gathered from the book, this is sort of run in the same way as a trial would be within court, because they did interrogate a couple of members of her family, all in order to assess whether or not this child is in actual danger, or whether it has already been endangered by Kelly Lane. So, first they interview Peter in front of everybody else. Peter, at this point, because so much time has passed, is actually Kelly's husband. So, he says he doesn't believe that she would have harmed the child ever. He believes in her story that this child was handed over to somebody, to this Andrew Norris person and that he believes this because she is a great mother and a great wife, and he doesn't believe that he would have ever harmed a child. Next would be her father, Robert, and here they ask him, you know, how did you feel in 2004 when you heard from the police that they're investigating Kelly? And he said, like, both him and Sandy were shocked, but he can't remember having much of a conversation about it because he said they didn't understand the seriousness of the matter, and they became detached to some extent because her wedding was coming up, and that was the main objective at the time. Sandy makes a similar comment when she takes the stand when they ask her about the day of Tegan's birth, because she was present at the friend's wedding as well, and she says Kelly didn't behave in an unusual way, 
and that well they didn't discuss things much because they were busy getting prepared for this friend's wedding. When they brought Sandy on the stand, they asked her if she was to come within the period of 95 and 99 to her and say, Mom, I'm pregnant, how would you have reacted to that? Sandy said that she would have supported her, but that she isn't really aware that Kelly would have known that she would have been supported. Of course, they grill her on that. And she says that they obviously had like the usual talks when she was younger about sex education. But since she was an adult, she had her views and they thought she could make up her own mind. After the parents, the immediate relatives, the husband, they also interviewed Duncan and all of her friends about everything that we have spoken about, how Kelly would be concealing her pregnancy and how they never suspected anything. And after taking everything into consideration and seeing all of the evidence, or rather lack thereof, that any of these Andrew, Morris, Melanie, Noelle, Nana, Julie, Melville exist, well, the coroner brought the following conclusion. He declared that he is comfortably satisfied that Egan Lane is in fact deceased. He is concerned that Egan had met with foul play, but he also stated that there still existed a possibility that she was alive somewhere. So, coroner ordered that a birth certificate would be issued for Tegan, and he recommended that all of the evidence and the transcript be forwarded to the New South Wales Homicide Squad for assessment and further investigation. So, that day, when Kelly and her family returned to their home in Manly, they knew that this was far from over. The New South Wales Homicide Squad now has all of the records and they see that they only briefly searched for Tegan among school records. So, on top of the school searches, now they conduct a number of other searches for Tegan. They go back to birth deaths and they go back to the New South Wales births, deaths and marriages. They go back to the New South Wales births, deaths and marriages registries. They interview and eliminate the possibility of other eight children that they found through this registry. They expand this search nationwide. They expand it with different spelling, different possible spellings of Tegan's name. Once they expand this, they expand the spelling and the possible names of father, Andrew, and mother, Mel, Melinda, Melanie, just to sort of like broaden their options. They approach Medicare looking for any medical records on vaccinations that a girl of this age would have had by now. The combined searches will result in the birth records of 86,000 children being checked. Out of all of those searches, there will be around 1,000 girls that match one or the other of those perimeters that they will investigate and then rule out. The media coverage on this case would really yield some information for the police. The receptionist from some of the abortion clinics that Kelly would appear at would call and give them any information that they have had about some of her earlier pregnancies. So, this would further loop police into a pattern. And the pattern that they have spotted and the theory that developed in their mind was that when Kelly would realize she was pregnant early enough, she would terminate the pregnancy. But when she realized it too late, she would be forced to give birth. They also checked the records of every single taxi company in Sydney and not a single cab would pick up a passenger from Auburn Hospital the day Tegan disappeared. They would have compiled a full list of Kelly's ex-boyfriends and then have taken DNA samples from them. Those DNA samples determined that the father of the first baby was a football player she was just seeing before she started dating Duncan, so the father wasn't Duncan. The father of her third child was the friend of her brother's whom she saw after breaking up with Duncan. Because of the publicity, the case was getting, like, the reporters, the journalists would be surrounding Kelly's home sometimes. They would be pissing Robert Lane off. And the family would later complain that this was indeed trial by media, that the police wasn't even doing much of the investigation, that everything was really handed over to them by media, and that that was damaging to their family, that that meant that the public would obviously be biased. 
Finally, in 2009, after further four years of investigation, the police has enough to make their move, and they make the arrest, charging Kelly Lane for murder of her daughter, Tegan Lane. The case goes to trial in 2010, and they select the jury with a mix of people with different views on abortion, adoption, and those who would contemplate on child murder, different views of sex and motherhood. So, 14 jurors are selected. From what I gathered, there were two extras, just to ensure that the verdict is held and that they don't need a new trial. The Crown, which is the prosecution in Australia, would point out the lengths that Kelly would go to in this story. If you remember, like, the grimmest parts of the story, when she would lie that she's overdue in order to get induced, they would point out how she lied to everybody how the reasons behind the extent that she went to would be described by defense as her planning to attend the Olympics or her being ashamed of her parents finding out, but in fact, it is her selfishness and callousness because she didn't have to resort to any of this because she could have avoided being pregnant in the first place. They also proposed the theory of a potential disposal site so, apparently, she would have known of this site because of her sports career, because of her planning to be in the Olympics. So, Auburn Hospital, where she gave birth to Tegan, was only a couple of kilometers away from Australian College of Physical Education, and this is where this Homebush Olympic site is. In 1996, apparently, this location was surrounding by this vacant land, a few building sites where the buildings were erected since then and some deserted roads. So, this area that Kelly would have been aware of because she was familiar with that college site would have been perfectly vacant for her to just dispose of this child's body. The core of the Crown's case would really be the inability of the police to find Tegan and to find the man that Kelly said that she gave Tegan to. The Crown would portray Kelly as this woman who would be getting insanely drunk until the point of vomiting, who would be sleeping around, there was a lot of slut-shaming when it comes to this trial, and who would get pregnant with whoever she was dating at the time, and then decide either terminate the pregnancy or get rid of the child if it's too late. But then the defense said, well, Kelly actually, according to the official records, only slept with four guys between the age of 17 and 24. So, if that makes her a slut, then that makes any average woman also feel like a slut. They also said that the fact that Kelly would try to give these children to adoption, that's exactly what shows you how she cares about them. Not to mention how much she actually cares about her own child and how everybody has testified to her being a great mother. She would have never harmed a child, let alone hers, and this is exactly why, at that time, when she was so desperate, she was desperate enough to hand it over to somebody who she thought would be giving this child a better life. The defense team used the fact that Kelly would go back to the Wright Hospital to try to give birth there to say that they really think that she forgot that she was here. She went there because she thought she had nothing to hide. Further, what kind of person would give a birth and then go to her friend's wedding and not give any signs of distress, not give away how she was feeling? If we are saying that she has actually just given birth and then disposed of that child in between those times. The things that left an impression on me that Crown did in this case were the following three plots that they have played at trial, because I think, as a juror, this would have impacted me the most. So, at first, now, again, her friends, Duncan, Stephen, they would all testify. But they would all give the same testimony about her character, and then the Crown lawyer would ask them, and are you still friends with the defendant? Are you still friends with Kelly? And all of the friends said no. Duncan said no. Her husband said that they got divorced because of the strain that this has put on their marriage. And I think as a juror, I would have been like, whoa, everybody has given up on this girl because of these lies. 
maybe we should be a bit harsher on her. Then the second thing that they did so well, and I just love it because both of her parents are characters in wrong senses of that word. They put both Sandy and Rob on the stand and they asked them, are they aware that during this adoption process, this social worker was told that they lived in London in 1999? Did they live in London? No. Okay, cool. So that's one lie that she said. And are you aware that your daughter said that you disowned her? And both of them just reflected shock upon their faces and the jury was like, oh shit, like they were not aware of that either. So Kelly, during this period of time, there was like 10 years there, where she could have told her parents about all of the lies that she got them involved in, but she just never bothered to communicate. It just tells you everything about this family. And then the third thing, was in order to show the amount of evidence, the amount of people that they have gone through, through like all of different registries, well, rather than just show them the pile of things, they actually brought two Andrew Norrises that they have found. One was from South Australia, the other one was from Victoria. So they flew them both in to give testimonies at this trial, just to show like the severity, just to show the severity of her lies that they had to like go through so many people and they did the same when it comes to Tegan where they interviewed this guy who had a daughter named Tegan and had a wife named Mel again just putting a human face to this fruitless search for Tegan and that day not a single member of the jury looked towards Kelly when they were to leave for the day Kelly's defense would in the end be resting on the lack of forensic evidence connecting her to any death or alleged disposal of the body. And they would say that who is to say that Andrew Morris Norris didn't hand over this child to somebody else or that they are not coming forward because they're ashamed of their actions. And the crown rested on all of the lies that Kelly Lane would have told throughout the years. They said that there is only one reason why Kelly would have given so many lies, and that is because she is responsible for Tegan's death, and she had no other information that could result in Tegan being found alive. So after a trial that lasted for four months, and after the jury deliberated for a week, on 13th of December 2010, they found Lane guilty of lying under oath in relation to the documents dealing with her adopting out two other babies. They couldn't reach a unanimous verdict when it comes to the murder charge, so the judge advised them to go back and reach a majority verdict. And they returned with the majority 11 to 1 verdict, finding Kelly Lane guilty of murder. Kelly Lane was given 13 years and 5 months to serve in custody and she will be eligible for parole in May 2023. As they read the verdict, Kelly collapses to the floor of that dock and the judge empties the courtroom while the paramedics enter to help her out. In the end, the story of Kelly Lane will end just the way it began with her, alone, still feeling like she can't reach out to her loved ones, to the people that she called friends and people that she called family. That is the meat of this story. Now, I still have a few things to discuss, so if you want to stick around, you stick around. If you don't, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and hopefully you're not as affected with this case as I am every single time that I speak about it, because what in the actual fuck? So, a couple of things that I wanted to discuss. One of them would be motivations, but before that, I just wanted to discuss the intention, because I think it's a bit different to what could have motivated her. This was mentioned in one of the court documents, but I think it's important in this case because we could say that motivations varied from the Olympics, from the shame, from her feeling alone and isolated and like she can't approach a single person to speak about this and to confide in. But I think that even if you don't believe any of these motivations are strong enough, that we can all agree that there was intent to kill in this case. A, because she wanted to abort these children to begin with. 
and then when she would realize she's too far along, in those cases she would not be able to terminate the pregnancy, so she would carry it to term, and then if possible would get these children adopted, and if not, they would have met the fate of Tegan Lane. And if you really see this as the intention to kill, then you can discard both the motivation, but you can also discard her future self, what she went on to do. This is what I would compare to like those parents, whether it's fathers or mothers, that would abandon their own children and then would go on and have like a whole other family and it would just be this blissful experience while they would completely neglect that they actually had their child in the past. And in this family, in this new circumstance, there would still be these amazing parents. And Kelly could have most certainly been both. And she could have been this happy great mother and great wife when it suited her, when there was no intention to hide her previous lifestyle, and as such there was no intention to terminate the pregnancies or to resort to adoption. If we turn towards motivations, we can only really speculate because she was never psychologically evaluated. As I mentioned, this would have probably been treated completely differently in the US, but here she wasn't. So when I first researched this case, this to me struck me as a compulsion, as somebody who just goes from one bad decision to the next without ever reflecting, and possibly without the ability to reflect. This Dr. Diamond that evaluated Kelly Lane during the trial said that she is capable of carrying out audacious and extremely difficult actions in order to solve problems that are in front of her. And he said that this repetition compulsion is the behavior that he described as a powerful drive to revisit an unresolved conflicted state. This means that due to this repetition, a person would reenact that exact state in a hope that the previously unsatisfactory and emotionally distressing experience can be corrected by managing this one more successfully. And he believed that Kelly was in the similar state of mind when she decided to get rid of her daughter Tegan Lane. In real life, we all probably know people that have repeated the same mistakes over and over again, and this could explain their state of mind, or those people that date the same guy or girl all over again just to see if they can change them this time, just to see if they can have a different outcome. So although it might not be rational, definitely not rational to me, it might not be rational towards you, but there is an explanation for this thought process. And when it comes to problem solving, I remember when I first spoke about this case, I compared it to when one spouse kills the other in order not to go through a divorce. Because to me, really, Kelly Lane never saw past a certain point. It was always like the obstacle that was right in front of her, that hurdle, and then later she's like, okay, well now there's another obstacle. It's like she never thinks five steps ahead. There's a limit of like one step ahead that she can face and that's about it. That's where she gets. And it's not logical to anybody else, but clearly it is something that she couldn't really escape. Or could she? Because still there's a really simple solution to it, which is contraception. It's just because in all of these sources that I have read, there's this constant repetition of she did it because she was ashamed, shame was powerful, shame, shame, shame. And I'm just thinking if shame was the only thing, if this was not something really enrooted in her, she would have learned from her mistakes, from one of them at least. She had like five of them. Well, six if you count the last one when she was all happy and thrilled to have a child. So she had plenty of time to learn from all these mistakes, but she never did. So I think there's something definitely deeper than this. And another thing that's, I'm sorry, but we can't discard is that this is part of her upbringing. There is just no way that you will convince me that this didn't come from Rob and Sandra, the behavior that they would display at home. Just even based on like five minutes of interviews that I have seen with them, I'm like, oh, oh, I kind of get it now. 
In the end, in this story, whether you think she is a narcissist, that she wasn't motivated to begin with, but she did this because she was a callous person, whether you think that these motivations strive more from just motivations behind Philly's side and not wanting a child in the first place to begin with, ever, and then only wanting it once she can create this family for him, or whether you think this was about a compulsion, whether she was doing every single thing in order to bring a better decision the next time. There are still so many unanswered questions about this case. I have pointed so many gaps in this investigation, so many gaps in Kelly Lane's thought process, but one that bothers me to this day is right now, 25 years after Tegan Lane was born, Tegan would be 25 in September, she is lying within prison cells after having served over 10 years in jail. What is going on through her head? That's what, every time I would research this, I would lie in bed and I would just be like, what is it, Kelly? Do you ever even think about it? Do you ever even reflect? Do you replay those hours between 12 and 4 p.m. in your head over and over and over again? Do you replay that route between the hospital and Duncan's place over and over again? Or do you simply lie in bed turn around and fall asleep peacefully, because that's what I would really, really like to know. So, in the end, the question that we all <laughs> gathered us all here for is, where is Tegan Lane? So, I think you're either ending this story today believing that Tegan is turning 25 this year, that she is somewhere unaware that she's Tegan Lane, maybe her name has been changed, and Andrew Norris never made her aware of this part of the story. Or you're leaving this story thinking that on 14th of September 1996, after leaving that hospital, Kelly Lane found a way to kill her child. It might not have been in a violent way. It was a small baby. It might not have taken much. The body of Tegan Lane has been disposed somewhere. She might have been disposed in multiple different ways that we don't know of. Or, what I have been bracing myself to say the whole day, it might be in one of the landfills. And in that case, we will never really know where Tegan Lane is. As I always say, by the end of this story, it is the story that flows better, that makes more sense, that is probably the story that actually happened. And in this case, I don't believe that Tegan Lane is with us. I would very much like to know your thoughts, your theories in the comments, and what you think Kelly did with her baby. And again, we can only speculate because she won't talk and she can apparently sleep inside of the prison cells. And a thought that occurred to me in the shower today that I never thought I will utter these words in my life, and that is, I was calculating her age, because she was born in 75, so I was doing the math, I was like, okay, 25 years here, 20 years here, and then plus one, 46. Thank you for attending my math lesson. I was like, okay, by the time she gets out of prison, she would have most definitely gone through menopause. And that is a good thing. In this story, very good thing. Ideal. Perfect. Let it all stop. Just finally let it all stop. Because I truly can't stop thinking where this story would have led. If her and Stephen weren't to break up and get divorced because of this trial, if she were on the outside, if she saw yet another unachievable goal as completely achievable and got pregnant with somebody else, with somebody that she just had a fling with, with somebody that she couldn't really come home with to her parents, what would have been the fate of that next child? And that is the story of Kelly Lane. I know that some of you might wish that I have never introduced her to you in your life, but this story pains me on the inside. I think, like, my mood has changed severely from the beginning of it towards the end. I don't think I'm the same person every time I cover it. I'm scarred for life, and that's why I talk about it.
Because sometimes you just gotta talk about these pioneers, these underdogs that commit these wild crimes that you have never heard of, and figure out what goes on in their head. And are we a step closer to it? I truly don't know. But I'm going to leave you with maybe some outtakes, I don't know. Maybe I laughed at some point. Maybe I had a life. Maybe I had prospects of future entertainment and comedy. Or maybe not. I don't know what I'm leaving you with. But I know that I'm gonna go shower, wash it, wash it, rinse it all off. And tonight, when I go to bed, I will not be thinking what Kelly, lying in her prison cell, is thinking, okay? And you shouldn't either. You should leave this with this video. With liking it, subscribing to this channel, and leave this saga behind, after obviously leaving the theories of it in, in the comments, and actually, you know, thinking about why somebody would have done this, and what you would have done in similar situation, hopefully never pushing it to this extent. And in doing so, <laughs> I'm doing the podcast outro, my, you keep making this world a better fucking place. I had to say, it. just so like, it rolls off a tongue. One more thing at a time. <laughs> this is literally so weird, because it's so, such a different concept of a story and a channel. But still, you keep questioning people, okay? And if your friend you suspect your friend is pregnant, your real friend, like not a fake friend, your real friend, and then the next day they show up and they don't have a baby bum, yeah, start a conversation with them, actually act as, as a friend. Mm. <laughs> All of the dislikes on this video are gonna be by whom? Kelly Lane's friends. Cool, cool, cool. Still, I stand by my words. I stand by my words, I stand by them. She had no friends and you can do better. So do it and exit this video right now and do better in life than Kelly Lane ever did. Okay, cool. Now, uh, <laughs> bye. This is for the friends in the outtakes. This is why I'm sitting so low. Look at the sweat patch. This one always sweats more than the other one. Although they're both catastrophic. Why do you share these disgusting facts with people? We're friends, okay? Are there any other sweaters making me feel better about myself? This light is making me insane. It's first of all blinding me, second of all it's making me sweat. Can we talk why are you dressed like Pam from The Office? I'm simply in my PJs. Why? This is YouTube. This is official workplace, Maya. Explain yourself. I just woke up and I'm so ready to rage. Ready to rage. She's severely triggering my lazy eye, like, my lazy eye has been, no, tiredness is triggering your lazy eye, okay? Let's not blame all of the life struggles today on Kelly Lane. Or maybe let's, let's maybe hold a woman accountable for the first time in her fucking life, because nobody seems to. Well, this case kind of does, eventually, after so many years. Are you coming in, bitch? Show your ass for the camera. Show it, bitch. Shake your ass for money. I'll monetize tomorrow if you shake that ass for the money. Yeah. Yeah. What you looking for, bitch? You're going to bed, bitch. Mm. Mm. Work it. Shake it. Helicopter style. <laughs> I hope it sounds like you're crazy on the camera. I hope so. It always sounds like I'm crazy on the camera. This man. Another reason, because I don't expect you to go and now watch like the freaking episode that I've done on the podcast, because all of the details will be here, right? Right? Cool. But you know, if you could, yeah, go subscribe to that channel. Another reason why I called that episode one of a kind, it's because that whole week as I was researching it, it kind of made me reminisce on that desperate housewife scene when Edie dies. And all the girls are like, yeah, let's say one word about Edie, one positive word, and everybody's like, hot, sexy, attractive, whatever. And Susan is like, I need four words. And she's like, one of a kind. I was like, this is how I want to be described at my funeral. So, just in case that somebody at my funeral doesn't utter the words, note them down. Note them, right, no, note them down. Right now, you make sure the words 
are uttered. Be the Susan that we all need. She was the most annoying character, but in that scene, fucking loved Susan. <laughs> Before I get enraged, Lisa, I'm in that like downhill phase after drinking Red Bull. I'm feeling you're still in the uphill phase. But you know how, like, when you open TikTok, these popular songs start playing and they introduce you to Billie Eilish's popular songs because you're a fake fan like that? And you know that tune, like, you made me hate this city and the, how they changed it to I talk shit about you on the internet. Truly, that sound change means so much about me because that would be me. Stay true to yourselves is my message of the day. If you want to not be petty, if you don't want to choose violence, that's on you. That is not my lifestyle. Sometimes, sometimes, pettiness. Choose pettiness. I am yet to regret choosing being petty. She says with a serious expression on her face. I am yet to regret it. Sounded Russian there. Russian! You Russian sestra! Russian sestra. Okay. Go splash water over your face and get to the fucking grip. Get the grip, get the grip, get the grip. Okay. The damage that Kagon legs would do if she was born during the primetime internet era. Imagine her on TikTok. Like, everybody would be like, wow, congratulations, Kelly. And her parents would still be like, Peekaboo! It's not written on her forehead! Nah, we don't acknowledge the pregnancy unless it's written on her forehead. And everybody's like, um, it's now about the sixth time. <laughs> if there was only a way that we could have seen, if there was only a way to figure out if a person is pregnant. You look good. Somebody passed by the car <laughs> playing my pony. <laughs> And this is the only thing that I regret today. Not catching this on this shiny microphone. I'm sorry. Wait, are we in the front? <laughs> Where are we, my? Yes, we are. <laughs> I lost track of fucking pregnancies. I hate this story. 